In a Congress divided by bitter partisanship, two members of Wisconsin's delegation are trying to buck the trend. Good morning. I'm News 3 political reporter Jessica Arp sitting in for Neil Heinen today. Fights over a speakership, the debt limit, and international trade are getting headlines, but under the radar, two of Wisconsin's own are trying to work together on some issues. I am joined this morning by Congressman Mark Pocan of Wisconsin's 2nd District and Congressman Reed Ripple of Wisconsin's 8th District. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Thank well, you. bipartisanship, what a contest, yeah. huh? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you guys have been trying to do since you've been on the Hill together. You know, a lot of different areas we've been trying to work together. You know, I think one of the approaches that we both have is just, you know, find out what you have in common, not what you don't have in common, because it's easy to figure out what you don't have in common and dwell on that. But if you find out what you have in common and try to move forward on it, you can actually get something done. And uh, Reed and I were both on the budget committee last session, so we have a couple measures around the budget that we've been working on. Uh, one bill to try to address how we score health care costs, because uh, right now things are scored at a 10-year out period, and if you do it a little longer, you might make different investments and others to change the budgeting process from uh, biannual or annually to a biannual process like we have in Wisconsin and a majority of the states and those are just a couple examples but you know I could go down a bunch of things where if Reed and I had the chance uh, we would just get done rather than you know sometimes if you watch the you know, nightly news uh, out of Washington, you think there are 20 or 25 members of Congress and they hate each other. Um, that's one view, but there are other ways to look at it. Well, what what kind of, tell me a little bit more about some of these bills that you've worked on, some sure. of these budget bills and, sure. and why they're why they're a good idea. Well, well, first of all, on, on our whole budgeting process is broken. So in the last four decades, literally from 1974 till today, not a single year has the Congress passed a budget and their appropriation bills on time. Not once. So if you have, if you have 40 years of brokenness, you might decide to do something different. And I was on the Budget Committee in my first year and it was really easy to identify what some of the problems were. And the bulk of them were centered around time. And so by moving to a two-year cycle where you do your budgeting in the first year and your appropriations in the first year, that opens up that second year to do oversight, and then you can make any type of reprogramming that's necessary. But in, in this case, it's not working at all. And so uh, I wrote a piece of legislation that would convert it to a biennial budget, which more than 20 states in the country already have, including Wisconsin, and uh, began to get to work on it. When Mark came in, I had a number of Republican members of the State Assembly and State Senate call me personally and say, listen, you need to spend time and go introduce yourself to Mark. Um, uh, even though he's from Madison and he's pretty far <laughs> to the left, you're going to find him to be a reasonable, smart guy and someone that you're going to like working with. And so Mark and I, uh, we had dinner together really early on, right when he first came to Congress and began to... Uh, to uh, build this friendship and, and look for things that we can agree on and we've been doing them for the good of Wisconsin and the good of the country. So tell me though, I, this was introduced at the beginning of the year and we're now nearing the end of the year and it hasn't moved forward. Why, why not? Actually it is moving forward uh, and much to Reed's credit. Uh, he has uh, officially a majority of Congress signed on. Um, he has what, 200 225 co-sponsors. And, and you need 218 technically to pass something. Our, our difficulty is how you get things to the floor of Congress, um, but he has been meeting with the majority leader and others to make sure we've got commitments who are supportive. He has the majority of the budget committee. I mean, you go down the list and Reed has really done his homework and I've helped to line up some Democrats where we could on this. And I think uh, this is one of those issues that has support among Senate leadership. Uh, we think potentially could even get through the White House and it would be a significant reform. It could be the single largest budget reform in the history of the country. And so it's a big deal, so people are taking some time to make sure we've got it right. But I, I, I would uh, project that there'll be a vote on this bill and it will pass the House of Representatives for the first time in history sometime this calendar year. It will then move to the Senate where both uh, Leader McConnell and Harry Reid, and so you got the leaders in both parties, have, vote, have voted for legislation similar to this in the past. And so we don't have an objection from either of the two party leaders over in the Senate. And Secretary Liu has sent me a letter saying that the Treasury is supportive of it. Every president since Ronald Reagan, Republican and Democrat alike, have supported this reform because they recognize the system doesn't work. So what about, though, I mean, while you two are sitting here and you've mm. developed a relationship, what about changing the process to two years though 
might make it any less divisive. We see it in the Wisconsin State Capitol. It's a two-year process, but that doesn't mean it's any less hard of a fight to get things. I think one of the significant things is when you take it out of an election year, that's often the year that gets the trickiest because you start getting closer and closer, especially in Congress, when one of the differences from the state leg legislature to Congress, uh, not only is, you know, I said sometimes in the le state legislature things move like a tortoise, in Congress they move like an upside-down tortoise, the process is slower, but also the election cycle starts literally the first few months after you've been elected, I would say two-thirds of the targeted, you know, um, competitive races already had opponents going in, so you're already in that cycle again. So the more you can remove yourself out of an election year, the more you can get a budget done and the process done, and then do all the review and analysis that we never really have a chance to do, which would be very helpful. Right, and, and I, I would say this, it's not a panacea, no one thinks it is. However, the toughest vote any member of Congress takes is on the budget. By moving that into the first year, the furthest away from the re-election cycle, you're more likely to get it done. Secondarily, since 1974, 80% of, of election years did not have a budget at all. And so if anyone thinks that what we have works, that uh, you just can't, you can't, the data does not support it. And so this is a, a potential fix, not a panacea, but it's a step in the right direction to, to address a problem that we have. Would it make, though, people less likely to want to take on reforms even in the off election years, knowing that it's going to last for two years? And I mean, we, we saw that in Wisconsin when you talk about the, the governor and the gas tax and transportation measures here. There were a lot of people reticent to do anything on that, raise taxes of any sort, because they knew that it could it could still affect them in an election. No, I think it'd be the exact opposite. Um, I mean, you, you have your most courage furthest away from the election cycle. When that budget comes on early, uh, er, the earliest date in the cycle is going to be around 18, uh, April 15th or so. We have to have that budget passed. You're pretty far away from an election, which gives you a chance to go home and make the case with your constituents so why you supported this budget or why you oppose it, depending on your on the case. And and you make the case with it. But then what, what's not happening today, Jessica, is there's no evaluation. There's no hearings on whether the, the agencies are actually living within the framework and guidelines. For example, the last week of the fiscal year, which just happened a few weeks ago, there was a spike of $20 billion in spending, and a full 20% of all federal spending happens in the last five weeks of the fiscal year. As agencies spend up money that they haven't had to use all year, but they're afraid they'll lose it. By going to a two-year cycle, you cut that in half. Yeah, the, the other thing is, you know, like last year in December, we had a cromnibus bill, a continuing resolution omnibus bill that did everything you're supposed to do in a normal budget process. If you pass a budget and pass the appropriation bills related to it, you have review and analysis done and, and a chance to have amendments and have a real debate. The other option, because we're not getting the process done, we had 48 hours to make a decision on a giant document that was pretty much everything that you're supposed to do over months and months, and you never get a good process out of that. So you know, this would really give us that opportunity to have what the majority of states have, and that's just Wisconsin. And I think one of the things I'd argue is part of what you saw in Wisconsin was when you have one party control, sometimes it becomes difficult around certain issues. Generally, you don't have one party control in history, therefore um, this is probably something that makes the process a little bit easier. Gotcha. All right, we will take a quick break and we will be right back with For the Record. Welcome back this morning to For the Record. I'm News 3's Jessica Arp. In this morning for Neil Heinen, we are talking this morning bipartisanship with two of Wisconsin's congressional delegation, Democratic Congressman from the 2nd District, Mark Pocan, and Republican Congressman from the 8th District, Reed Ripple. We've, of course, been talking a lot this morning about what you've been doing together, but there are issues that divide you as well. It, big sure. issues coming up before Congress. They're going to have to deal with before November 3rd with the federal debt ceiling, which is when the Treasury Secretary says the U.S. government will run out of money to pay its bills. If it isn't lifted by Congress, the federal government could shut down, as it did a couple of years ago. Outgoing Speaker John Boehner has said he wants to deal with this problem before he leaves Congress. I expect that uh, we might have a little more cooperation from uh, uh, some around town to try to uh, get as much finished as possible. I don't want to leave uh, my successor uh, a, uh, a dirty barn. So. The question remains then, how does this get fixed? Does Congress raise the debt limit? Well, we're going to reach the debt limit for about the 130th time or more. Mm -hmm. Every single time the debt limit's been reached, the debt limit's been raised. If you want to solve this problem and actually fix it, 
what you should do is when you vote or pass a budget, the debt limit ought to be part of that vote. And I think what you'd have is people taking a closer look at the budget itself, because if, you, if the budget is approving the spending, the debt limit is approving the payment. And so if you're going to spend the money, you've got to pay for, the, pay for it. Now, the, the debt limit breach, or when you get to it, has historically been used as a way to make policymakers push them to make the tough decisions that are necessary to get us back to balance. And so uh, it's going to get raised. What happens and what, what deal is negotiated with the White House between now and then, I'm uncertain of, but it will happen. Yeah, it's it's think of it this way. You know, passing the budget is uh, writing the check, putting it in an envelope, and having a stamp on it. The debt limit, raising debt limit, is dropping it in the mailbox. Right? We've already approved it. So what Reed is saying is, is completely right. It shouldn't even be this second step, but part of, again, the slowness uh, and maybe this somewhat leading to the dysfunction in Washington is the fact that we have to have this, which will lead to a whole new set of fights. In the next few months, we have a transportation bill, we have the debt limit, and then we have uh, funding for government running out on December 11th, I believe is the date. And uh, with all of that, that's a lot to get done in the middle of a speaker's race. It's right. fascinating because when, when a Republicans in the White House and Democrats control the Congress, Democrats are all opposed to raising the debt limit. When a, when a Democrat in the White House and Republicans hold Congress, Republicans are all opposed to raising the debt limit. And so a lot of this is just a charade, quite frankly. What we need to do is get our fiscal house in order by managing the money correctly at the front end so that we don't have to continue to repeat this cycle of dysfunction all the time. Given that there's so much uncertainty in the speakership right now, it, I mean, it, is there any chance that somebody's going to try to hold this hostage and we're going to get into a situation where we have a protracted government shutdown like we did in 2013? I, I think you'll have talk about it. And don't forget, we've got a lot of people running for president who serve in the Senate right now that would love to do anything to try to stand out in that crowd. So, you know, what we're going to have to try to do is make sure that adults uh, who are in Congress uh, make sure we try to get past that. Because if you shut down government, um, I think last time we shut down the government for 17 days, it cost the economy about $28 billion. This time, you're getting closer to holiday season. Uh, you could even have a bigger impact and you know people are just unsure whether or not they're going to have a paycheck or what the economy brings and that can affect a lot of things don't forget for retailers that is their season of the year so I'm hoping that again uh, this is one where the adults will come in and I think with the remaining days we have a speaker Boehner hopefully you know he'll say he got forced out and he never should have been someone who's never done not under indictment is never you know it's not very often you step down to be speaker hopefully this is some of the legacy he can leave I don't see any chance of a shutdown it's very very low very low this will get resolved. It's like I said, we, history shows it gets resolved. It's always been resolved, and it will be resolved again. Is it going to be resolved in time to prevent any of the, you know, issues with the U.S. credit? I mean, oh, yeah. to pre yeah, prevent some of those. It'll be resolved before things. then. It'll be it'll be done before November third. Does the speaker's race affect some of this, though? No, not in my opinion. Yeah. We, we hope not. I, I don't know yet. I mean, it's just one of those things that depends if in order to get the number of votes you have to get, that you have to even give lip service to people who want to spend a little more time pounding the table. But again, in the end, I do think you know, people realize that that shutdown last time cost the economy a lot. And quite honestly, politically, it cost the Republicans a lot in polling. However, then the rollout of the website for the Affordable Care Act came, which then took care of all that. I think, you know, people who have a memory will remember that was a disaster if uh, they do have a shutdown. Yeah, I, I just don't see it happening. Um, the speaker will stay in till the end of the month. This is November 3rd, so it's just a few days uh, before he's scheduled to actually step down. But he's already announced he's not going to step down until there's a replacement. So I don't, I don't see any scenario where this doesn't get dealt with before he leaves. Gotcha. The one, you mentioned that there's a transportation bill that has to get resolved as well, and you're on the transportation I committee. Am. So can you tell us what what's being talked about? What's new that we might see in that? Sure. Bill? Well, the the Senate has already moved, and they've passed a six-year authorization. However, they on, they're only funding it for three years, so it's not a six-year bill; it's a three-year bill. We're going to do our markup in the committee the last week of October, and we're going to move toward a six-year bill. Ultimately, you have to have funding for it. But at the end of the day, absent, absent the courage of the Congress to tell the American people the truth, that if you want to buy something, you have to pay for it, and for Republicans to just kind of 
you know, step up to the plate and say, if this is important enough for us to purchase, it's important enough for us to pay for, at that point, I think you can get to a funding. If we cannot get to a funding, it will be another extension. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is that we'll just have another extension. It doesn't seem to matter who's in power. Nobody wants to tell the American people that the gas tax has to go up or you have to change this method of funding for it or people riding transit are going to have to pay another 50 cents. I mean, nobody wants to, to do any of these very modest things to, to have the user actually pay for them. Uh, I would rather just tell them the truth. If you want good roads, you've got to pay for good roads. If you're okay with really bad roads, well, then we can leave it the way, the way it is. But it would be bad for the U.S. economy for us to not address transportation. So which of those things would you prefer, of gas tax increase, of any of these I, I would fees? I would prefer to see all of them. Uh, I would like to see a complete rewrite of how we're doing it. You're going to have to pull transit users in. There's 58 billion transit rides a, a year, that, and they're not paying anything on infrastructure right now. You're going to have to pull them in. You're going to have to raise the, the fuel taxes, and you probably should index them. And then you're going to have to deal with electric, uh, electric vehicles. About 100,000 of those are being sold a year that are using the roads, but, but they're, they're freeloading on the roads, and we need to have them part of that equation. If you get all the users in, any types of increases are extraordinarily modest, and, and you're, you're right there with full funding. What I've been telling my colleagues is all deficit spending is nothing but future taxation. So stop telling the American people you're not raising taxes. You are, and you're raising them on 12-year-olds, and they ought to stop it. See, and what's unique about this conversation, especially compared to a lot of conversations in Washington, is rather than just kicking the can for a few months because we won't sit down and have a conversation about the details of funding, um, that's bad for local you know, units of government, for states trying to plan for their transportation spending. It's bad for the contractors who have to buy the equipment to do the jobs because how do you plan three months at a time? What we're both saying is we want to have a long-term plan, but we're willing to sit down and talk through those details on how to do it. And, and Reed, again, is I, th I think very much to his credit, is unique among some of the folks that we're dealing with who don't want to have those talks about the revenue. Reed is very pragmatic, saying, look, we've got to do it. We've got to have a transportation bill that extends. And, but, but that's the conversation. That's the uniqueness out of this. And the particularized details, that's when we'll sit down and figure it out. But the fact that we're willing to talk revenue right. is unique. Very quickly, toll roads. Wisconsin has been looking and interested in doing that. Would an allowance for toll roads be yeah. in that bill? Yeah, I, I think it will. I think ultimately states will have the authority to, to toll on their own roads. The federal government's not going to come in and mandate tolls, but they're likely to give the states the, the authority to toll the interstate system if they choose. Okay. We will take a quick break again and be right back with For the Record. Welcome back to For the Record This Morning. I'm News 3's Jessica Arpin for Neil Heinen. And this morning, we are talking to two of Wisconsin's congressional delegation, Democratic Congressman from the 2nd District, Mark Pocan, and Congressman Reed Ribble from the 8th District. And we wanted to talk about another issue that's been in the news lately, the Federal Perkins Loan Program for College Students. That's the program that gives low-interest loans to students for financial aid. It expired September 28th after the U.S. Senate failed to pass an extension Pokin, who authored the bill to extend the loans, has been calling on the Senate to authorize the Perkins Loan Program. We all depend on financial aid, and it's a gift to be here. We love being here. We need all the help we can get to pay for it. This program is important. It's uh, an important um, part of a financial aid package, and quite honestly, the idea that somehow students are going to be able to get um, this kind of uh, funding, a couple of thousand dollars in their financial aid package somewhere else, is simply not true. So now we know that the House passed this on a voice vote and it got held up in the Senate. So what can we do? What happens next with this? Well, you know, this is one of those cases where uh, Mike Bishop, a Republican from Michigan, and I put this bill out there. Uh, we got it passed to get on a voice vote. So it went through unanimously, you know, through the House and got held up by Lamar Alexander in the Senate. So we're trying to do whatever we can to convince him. He, I think, is using it as leverage to try to get the Higher Education Reauthorization Act done, which we all want to have done. But the problem is the Perkins program, in case that doesn't happen, which 
could very likely happen. A lot of things in Congress move very, very slowly. Um, this has been a program in place since 1958. Fred Risser is finishing his freshman year uh, in the legislature. Right and this, the date. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been around for a while. <laughs> what we've got to do is we found funding to extend at least for a year. We can still have the broader conversations about the program and the higher education reauthorization. But there's four or 5,000 students at UW-Madison uh, that won't have that available if we don't get it reauthorized. And we're doing everything we can to make sure the Senate uh, comes and does what the House did. My guess is it gets reauthorized at the Omnibus. And so by December 11th or 12th, it'll be included in a larger package, and it just gets done that way. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It's being, you can hold up, you can object to anything in the Senate, hold up legislation. He, he does want to get a larger education bill passed. He's using it as a lever point, uh, but I think ultimately it gets done. Does it need to be changed? The program need to be changed? Like he was saying, he was saying that's why I was holding it up. We needed to change the format and how Perkins loans were were handed out. I, you know, I think, you know, his conversation, some people talk about should we have fewer programs, you know, should we, how should we figure out financial aid until we're at the capacity to have that conversation, which is why the Higher Education Reauthorization Act would be a place to do it. We at least have to continue the funding because what I was fearing is I was starting to hear people talk at that September 30th date when the program wasn't reauthorized, can I continue to go to the UW? And I don't want anyone to think that they're going to have to potentially leave because we're still doing everything we can to make sure it happens. So bottom line, you know, whether we talk about Perkins, uh, we talk about the budget bills that you guys have done, bottom line, you guys can sit here and say, we're working together and isn't this great. But if Congress can't work together as a whole, how do how does th how does this help? How do, how why should people at home care? Well, well, the <laughs> the answer to that is relatively simple. Would would people at home rather that no one is? The fact of the matter is there's way more, more people working in this way than the American people are aware of. Part of the reason Mark and I wanted to even do this together is because we wanted to show the American people that there is a lot of effort going on that you often don't see because it doesn't make the national news. It's not the entertaining thing. When things work correctly, that's not news anymore. It, you'd think it would be because they always talk about dysfunction and what doesn't work. But in fact, it works better than what most people are aware of. Yeah, I agree completely. You know, it's not interesting on news to say Congress worked today. Uh, we passed a, a sustainable great growth rate fix for Medicare along with CHIP funding for children with all but about 25 votes in Congress in a bipartisan way, waiting 17 years to be authorized, and it happened, and it got no coverage because that's just our jobs. And instead, it's, it's more fun to report on all the dysfunction. But this does happen way more often. And I'm just you know fortunate that we've got a colleague here in Wisconsin and we can go around and try to talk about it like this. Great. Well, thank you guys both for being, being with us this Good to morning. Be here. We will sure, be uh, right back shortly with For the Record. Thanks for joining us this Sunday morning. And thank you to my guests, Congressman Mark Pocan and Reed Ripple. We will, of course, see you next Sunday on For the Record.